On the agenda tonight, we're going back to 1974. We're going to be taking a look at the Bee Gees and they're going to be performing I Can't See Nobody. Hello, Phil here from Wings of Pegasus and welcome to another analysis video. If you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. So let's get the Bee Gees up on screen. And by the way, I am going to be jumping into this about halfway through. So if you want to watch it the whole way through without me interrupting it, click on that link in the description below and you can do that. It is one of those performances that I suggest you watch all the way through because of the mood and the feel of it. But let's jump into this performance. <laughs> I'm just going to jump in here just to explain a little part that we have when Robin looks over to the side of the stage it seems like from the comments on the video that I'm watching here that somebody tried to get on the stage or a girl tried to get on the stage and the security had to step in in order to stop her getting onto the stage but that was the commotion as you can see Robin just doesn't miss a beat and continues to sing as well as checking out the side of the stage to see what's going on there is so much going on from a compositional perspective as well as a vocal perspective because we've got Robin's vocals under the spotlight here and he had such a unique vocal quality to his voice which was just almost the embodiment of vulnerability having that slight wobble in his voice that was a vibrato but it was so subtle in there he also combines this with airflow and there's quite a deal of air in his vocal sound and he also uses up all of his air in each phrase that he sings and doesn't exhale after a vocal phrase. So to give an example of that, the first lines of the song when he sings, I walk the lonely streets, I watch the people passing by. You don't hear the exhalation after because the vocal cords are coming together very lightly and that's what's going to make it sound vulnerable and also just make you connect to the delivery because it sounds emotional, almost like he's on the borderline of crying but he's not quite there yet. To give you the other example of bringing your vocal cords together more tightly, more forcefully, you might have heard this before when singers sing, I'm going to just sing the same line, I want the lonely streets. I watch the people passing by and you hear the exhalation after the vocal phrase because the compression in there passing by 
ah, that's how whole compression of the vocal cords is because they're being pushed together a little bit more forcefully rather than passing by and just stopping that vocal sound. The other effect that this has by cutting off that vocal phrase and not applying vibrato to the end of it or exhaling, it makes it sound hesitant as if the person telling the story is really emotionally affected by the story and almost can't get it out because it is so emotional and to a certain extent doesn't really want to tell you the story because they're so self-conscious about it. And all of these emotions and feelings that you experience when you're listening to a singer who is communicating these emotions to you, it just takes you to a different place and is such a great example of someone who can put their feelings into a vocal because you can tap into them. If somebody was trying to sing this the way that Robin sings it by applying the techniques, they won't get it to sound the same because they're trying to apply techniques in order to sing it rather than just allowing Robin to sing it and then have a look at what he's doing in his voice in order to try and simulate it or emulate it as best you can, but you're never going to get the feeling that Robin can put into this because it's his voice, it's his song, it's his emotions that he's communicating with through his voice. It's something that you'll see with all of the best covers. When somebody covers a song and it is seen as a top level cover and everyone loves it, it's not because the person doing that cover is trying to copy the exact techniques, the same tremolo vibrato, the same air in the sound, the same vocal tone. They're not trying to copy the previous artist they are singing with their own voice and putting their own emotion into it. So that's a really important thing to distinguish between an original artist performing a song and connecting with you and then somebody else doing a cover of that song and still connecting with you even though they didn't write the song is because they are singing it with their own personality and with their own expression and to a certain extent their own life experiences that they are applying to the song which has inspired them and you get to hear in their vocals the inspiration that they feel when they sing the song and it's all about them expressing themselves in their own way and applying their voice to that original composition. Just a quick word on the vibrato as well, because it is subtle and it is bordering on that tremolo vibrato. So he's using his diaphragm, he's using his air in order to achieve the sound. So the first line, I walk, just like that, I walk the lonely street. It's so light, but it is the breath that is giving the sound of vibrato. He's not going, I walk the lonely street and taking the note, he's going, ah, ah, ah. So it is air combined with vibrato, it's half and half. And this isn't something that Robin would have been sitting there practicing, trying to manipulate the pitch to a certain extent to balance against the tremolo and have vibrato mixed in there. It's just something that he's producing because he's tapping into a feeling and an emotion. And when he taps into that, this is the sound that is produced. And you know that that is the fact because you can lock into it yourselves when you're listening to him sing. There is so much to talk about in this performance. Just to give you guys a reference point timeline wise, we're in 1974 here. So the whole disco thing and Saturday Night Fever didn't kick off for another three years. So that is before that whole movement. And I do have another video on the Bee Gees here somewhere. If you wanna check that out with their career and the history involved in that video as well. But here, we're gonna be looking at the vocal still, and I will be getting into the guitar at the end of the video. I just wanna mention quickly Barry's vocal. When he comes in with the chorus, he's taking that lower harmony line, technically, because the lead vocal is Robin's, but it is the main line that you can hear. And Barry's pitch is so dead on the whole time. And interestingly, when he applies his vibrato, it is totally different to Robin's. And again, this is something that they wouldn't have sat down and planned and said, right, 
which vibrato are you going to use? And then I'll do the opposite. They just had their own voices and use them. And Barry has that slower, wider vibrato, which works so well when the three of them combine and harmonize with each other. Their unique voices independently just gelled so well together. And you can probably attribute that to the fact that they're brothers and they've just got that link mentally as well. They know exactly where each other are with melody and harmony. Barry also has got that richness and fullness to his lower register. And it's not something that people will immediately attribute to Barry and the Bee Gees because of the disco sound and the way that he went into what people consider a falsetto sound but for me, that is Barry's head voice because he hits notes right up there and holds them for a hell of a long time. He can just keep on hammering away in his head voice, but he's putting air into his head voice sound because if he was singing that in true falsetto, any long held note, he would lose his breath within maybe four to five seconds because the vocal cords aren't connected. And when he does hit a note in head voice and he holds it for ages. That is those vocal cords connecting with air in the sound. In the verses, we're around E4, but also in that same verse, you'll hear Robin just tweaking it up to an A4. And that's in that male tenor range. It is one of those notes that most guys would really struggle to get to. The impressive thing here is the way that Robin just floats up there in his head voice and isn't trying to belt out these notes. He's got total control of them. Now, I want to draw your attention to Robin's mental imagery, his body language. Like I said, there's a lot to talk about in this performance, but watch his left hand because he is picking out these notes with that light vocal cord coordination and configuration and just touching his fingers together when he wants to get slightly higher up, but keep that sound light. And it is something that I've referred to many times on this channel before about watching a singer's body language and the way that they use their arms and hands in order to picture their vocal cords to get a light coordination between their vocal cords. They'll often just touch their first finger to their thumb or their second finger, and it will be that kind of movement. And you'll be amazed at how many times you see that with either hand. It just so happens that in this case, Robin is using his right hand to push against his ear so that he can hear his own voice within his head. And this is something that happens commonly, especially back in the 70s, where they may not have had a lot of fold back and there's a lot of volume behind you from the orchestra in this case, but just the band in general. But let's get back into the performance and we'll watch it until the end. Every single word you hear is coming from this part of life I've never felt like this before A love like yours So young and mine But stand like mine To my baby It doesn't work out any old way And there we have it. It was interesting. When we jumped straight back into the video, you could see Robin pointing out the notes. And this is something again that I've referred to 
Some singers see the notes visually in front of them and might lift their hand up if they're going higher or down if they're descending. And you could see that whole body language of the way that Robin is accessing these notes. Whatever helps you in order to visualize where notes are, it's great to have that in order to get your vocal cords to start storing the muscle memory to snap to the same notes because that's all singing is when you do learn to sing it's your vocal cords snapping to a particular point and if you imagine that as a particular point on your visual keyboard then you've got something to store you've got a place that you can go to in order to hit those notes so that is something else to look out for with singers when they're moving their hand up and down ascending descending sometimes singing a run that might be quite complicated you might see them doing this with their hand and moving up and down because they're trying to find those notes and are flipping from one to the next very quickly so guitar wise is relatively straightforward here we've got an e minor a d sus 2 you probably want to play in the verse and an a and then into the chorus we've got the a the d the e so again relatively straightforward the interesting thing about this and the way it's played is the rhythm because in the verse, if you are playing this on the guitar, you'll probably want to pick it to get the right feel, but here we've got the string section involved, so you're not necessarily concentrating on the guitar that Barry's playing. By the way, you might see Barry playing in other videos just putting down his first finger, and this is because he used to tune his guitar to a chord, and then would just place in the chord with that first finger, because if you bar across all the strings, you're just moving the chord higher up. And in this case, I think he's probably tuned to D, so that his open strings are a D major chord, and then the other chords that we'll have is an A on his seventh fret, and his E will therefore be on the second fret. So you might see him moving through those positions. It is difficult to tell here, but that's what I'm going to guess or assume that he's doing if he is playing with that finger going all the way across. So the feel that we've got going on in the verses is very much E minor, A, E major, change, to the E minor again. I love that change from the major to the minor. It's so cool, especially with the way the vocal melody works over the top and the way that when you end the chorus, you get into that E minor and you can keep that same note from the chorus running into the E minor. It's just so melodic, but anyway, it means that I'm picking here in order to get the same feel. Obviously the strings here, you're not gonna be listening to the guitar as much. It's not very high in the mix at all. If you do want to apply a strumming sequence to this, it's probably going to be a little bit more held back. Probably just a down, up, down will do. So going down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down. You could even throw in a little bit of down up between your chords, but that'll get the chords to now pop out a little bit more. It depends whether you want to make a little bit of a feature of your chord changes, or whether you want your guitar to sit in the background. But with that little down up change, it means we're going down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down. And it's that that down, up, down that I was talking about, it might get it to pop out a little bit too much. So it's all about subtlety here. Because of the lead vocal that Robin is producing, you wanna make sure the focus is the vocal and that everything just sits in the background. The great thing about this song and this live performance is the way that we go on a journey just in the verses before we even get to the chorus because halfway through, you'll hear the electric guitar come in with rhythm just going And you can hear the top end of that guitar and the top end of the chords just cutting through a little bit, but being applied with palm muting so that it's not a full out strumming action here with open strings. Because that would be well over the top. It's all about keeping that subtlety. Interestingly, when we get into the chorus, 
Barry is applying the strumming pattern that I mentioned in the verse. If you want to make a little bit more of a focal point of your chord changes and get them to stand out a bit more, then throw in that down up. And that's exactly what Barry is doing for that reason, because he wants the chorus to stand out a little bit more and be a little bit more open dynamically than the verse. So he's going A and he's throwing in that little down up down in order to keep that open dynamic in the chorus so we've got this And then the E minor then sets off the verse. Those chords, by the way, were just an A, a D sus2, and an E. And you just want to make sure that you spend a whole bar on the A. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Like that. And obviously half a bar on the D sus2 and the E. And when you get to the end, it's just going to be an A, E like that. Even though you don't hear the guitar in that part predominantly because of the strings and everything, it might be very lightly played, but the dynamic is being brought down again in order to get into the verse. So there's another transition to look out for, the way that the chorus comes down at the end so that it's not a random jump dynamically back into the verse, because the verse is really understated here. So if you went from all out into suddenly a quiet verse, it would just be a bit too much of a shock. So it's another great thing that the Bee Gees do. They just lead you into the next section by giving you a clue as to where you're going before you get there. Another thing we have added in there for the last chorus, another sight to see on the journey of the song, is that change in timing between the chord changes. So we are now changing on four and. So we're going one, two, three, four. And that's where it's happening. So if we're going one and two and three and four and. So it's just before the start of that next bar. And that is going to continue. So we go one, two, three, four, and two, three, four, and two, three, four, and two, three, four, and. And they keep throwing in that change. So having that little jump in there again is just adding an extra little ingredient that's going to make that last chorus stand out when compared with the other choruses. So that it's always a journey. And this is the thing about the great songwriters is that they will always put something new in there. They'll give you an extra instrument that's just added to the mix, maybe halfway through a verse or in the chorus. And then in the second verse, there'll be something else that pops out. And then there'll be a change of timing. And there is always so much that you can listen to multiple times in a great song. There'll be something else that you didn't notice the first time you heard it, or even the 30th time through, you still haven't noticed everything yet. And you can just listen and really appreciate top songwriting. But Thank you guys so much for suggesting this video for me to take a look at and keep those suggestions coming in the comments below. Let me know what you guys think. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and I'll see you guys at the next one. Rock.